Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where we talk about the Beatles all the time here. Anything that comes to mind, the past, the present, the future, their days together, their solo years. And we always have special guests here on the channel, and we certainly do this time out. We have two of the guys that make up the Weaklings, and you've heard me talk about the Weaklings on all my podcasts and on my radio show, Every Little Thing. We may have another guest crawling along the screen there. <laughs> one cool cat. that's okay it's like having ken womack on the channel this cat, he's part of the show hello mm -hmm. so we have uh glenn burtnick with us aka lefty weakling you're hello. You're, lefty. you're lefty because there's a lefty wilbury aren't you no he's well, lefty because he's left-handed i am left-handed but, too, but yeah. I mean, it's it's that's a nickname that you share in common with the wilburys well, that's we're in good company. Yes, you are. <laughs> who who came first? Oh, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> and also Bob Berger's with us, aka Zeke Wilbury. The Zeke I'm assuming comes from the Wizard of Oz. Zeke Weakling. <laughs> I like the I like Zeke Wilbury, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh no, Zeke did not come from the Wizard of Oz. Uh <laughs> Zeke uh, Zeke rhymes with weak and uh and yeah. and uh, actually it's a name that I used when I was in high school. So okay. Been around a long time. The only other Zeke I know is from Bert Lar. So you'll have oh. to uh, forgive me for that. <laughs> All right. It's a good reference. I like it. It's a good reference. I didn't know that. Yeah. So. You could yeah, spread the rumor that it's about, you know, it's, yeah, I, it's okay. I love Bert Lar. <laughs> Yeah, we're big Burt Lar fans. Yeah, yeah. totally. I do that. That's that's part of the reason why I like you guys. <laughs> One of the reasons, but you know, we can disclose that. Um, so you have a brand new CD out. It's called Raspberry Park, which we have right here. There it is. Always in good company here with all these weakling CDs. We got three. Yep. Before that, we got Studio Two, right here. We got your first one, Monophonic. Yep. I even got Bob's solo CD right here. Oh, nice. That, nice. Bob was on my channel as soon as he released it. So uh, this is now your fourth studio album. And um, I sometimes wonder, are you kind of progressing the way the Beatles did in their sound? Because you listen to Raspberry Park and there's definitely a 1967 sound with the Mellotron-ish sounds on the title track. Um you kind of sound like it's 1966, 67 weakling style. You know, if you if you uh, perceive it that way, Ken, it must be right. But I think that was kind of our our pl our loose plan from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, the first couple albums were recorded in the way that the, the we, that the Beatles recorded their first couple albums, and we you know did it at Abbey Road. Uh, and then, you know, our idea was that the, the three album was going to push more toward Revolver, Rubber Soul, which which it kind of did. And, uh, you know, then this is an, another step forward. And, and and Glenn had the terrific idea to include these um, little interlude pieces that kind of make it feel more like an album, kind of make it feel a little, little like the White Album. Uh, so I, I love it, you know, so. I was wondering why you did that. In a way, I really like that that um, extra feature on the album, but a song like Samson, I'm getting into, and it's kind of frustrating. I want more of the song. That's funny. Yeah, you know, our our, our drummer and smokestack, Joe Belia, said, uh, you guys said the same thing. He said, well, why don't you just finish the song? He said, that's a really good song. He goes, you know, maybe we will. Maybe we'll put it on another album. I don't know. Yeah, I, I I agree. I I, I think uh, we should expand it and do it. You know, like I, yeah, I think it's a good song. Huh? I th you know I, I have to say though, um, we did kind of discuss early on that maybe we'd develop similarly to the Beatles' development um, since we did start using them as our template, but. Uh, throughout the the time that we were leading up to the release of this album, we were just really just recording songs. And I, but personally, I didn't, I, I had nothing in mind like uh, concerning Beatle records or anything like that. Um, we would, you know, I, 
my work was just uh, let's let's come up with some good songs and and um yes in the the eleventh hour we're almost done and uh I came up with a couple of ideas as inter interludes mm. and so did Bob and um so we each kind of threw a couple uh, tracks on there and uh yeah but the, ultimately you're right the psychedelia of the cover suggests you know uh trippier thoughts uh, certainly the opening track with the mellotron and the strawberry fields type drums that does kind of put it all together and and uh, you know i like to think that it does kind of announce that you're about to take a journey with us mm. Plus, when you got words like pineapple stars and sunflower hearts, that kind of makes you think flowery, nineteen sixty-seven. Yeah. Well, you know, cannabis is legal in New Jersey now, so I'll just leave it there. Okay. Glenn's done his summer of love show so many times that it's burned into his head. So. Yeah. Well, at, to, to be honest, long before the summer of love shows, I mean, I I, I am way into psychedelia uh, as yeah. a uh, art form, and. Uh, you know, the music and, and the color of that era, you know, all of it, uh, very important to me. Okay. You know, I have to agree with Glenn that it, it, the songs that I, you know, kind of uh, put on, I helped put in the record, we also were not thinking about the Beatles specifically on, on this one, and not nearly as much as we did in previous albums. But yeah. when it all came together, it kind of, it, it kind of, <laughs> It sounds like we did it on purpose, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which great. <laughs> Take you it. always managed to slip in a line from a Beatles song or something in there where you. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you didn't really do it too much here. No, but that is that is something that we started doing in the very beginning. Yeah. Quoting and not only Beatles songs now we're quoting, you know, we we have this song Brian Jones about one of the Rolling Stones and and we quote uh, 96 tears as a line in a song, you know, and so that's sunny, kind of, that is sunny kind and of share. A, yeah, what's that? Sun, oh, yeah, sunny sunny and and share. Yeah, we rip them off a little bit, you know, so th bit. yes, we we use reference points from the 60s, which is both Zeke and I come from the 60s. We grew up in that era. Uh, we were kids, but we, but it certainly left an impression. And uh, the Beatles, you know, if we're sounding like them or not, they really did lay down the template for us as songwriters. I'll say that it's it's tough for us for us to avoid them. Yeah. But Ken, see see if you can find uh, the please please me reference on the record. Ah. There was one song where I heard the descending notes, da, 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 but it wasn't pushed up in the mix. It was kind of buried a little bit. Like oh, he, he did catch it. Good man. But what song was this? I can't remember what song that was. Is that All the Cash? I think. Yeah, all it's the solo, in, the, the solo, the guitar solo in All the Cash. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there was one <laughs> solo in there that was almost like what George Harrison played in Real Love. It might have been on She's, She's Leaving Home. You know what? It it is and i mentioned that to john you know so john took the recording home and he worked on it in his home studio and he composed his guitar solo for that song uh -huh. and at one point um i noticed that and i said to john i said you quoted um yeah what's that song uh real, real love. Yeah. no not real love the other one Freeze um, a bird free as a bird. Okay. I said to John, you quoted, I, I caught you quoted free as a bird. And he said, I did. He didn't. Know. <laughs> well, so there you go. So well, maybe it says, uh, uh, you know, we don't even realize what we're doing it when we do it. Yeah. yeah and I got to confess that I'm being educated right now. I didn't know any of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you know that the end of George's solo in real love that da, 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 there's something in that solo. And she's leaving home that reminds me of that. Maybe it is real love. Maybe it is real love. Mm -hmm. I don't it's know. It's inescapable. Gonna... Yeah. Oh. It isn't. For us, it's it's hard to stay away from the Beatles. Well, this is a very important question that I have to ask you because I've seen you guys in concert several times. And I have to admit, because I like your original stuff so much, I'm not necessarily going to hear the Beatles stuff. Sometimes I feel like there's too much Beatles. 
you know, so how do you define the band yourself? Because some people will think you're a Beatles tribute band. Some of them go with that expectation to hear a lot of Beatles stuff, you know, and I, I don't mind hearing certainly some Beatles songs in concert, but I'd much rather hear you guys do your own stuff with a few Beatles songs. I mean, yeah, you know, that's something that we have to play by ear at every gig. Hmm. You know, it, you know, if we think the audience is composed of a lot of Ken Michaels types, then we're going to emphasize the originals. And sometimes we do. We have done shows that were strictly original shows. Oh. But, you know, if we're if we're out, you know, in in, I don't know, Kansas or somewhere and, and, and the people don't know us very well then we're going to we're going to emphasize the Beatles stuff because it, it, we we need to get our our foot in the door. So. Yeah, it's it, it's a it's a tricky thing actually. You know, the the evolution of the Weaklings was we started out as hey, let's just throw some gigs together. We'll just play some local joints and mm -hmm. do Beatles songs. And 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 then it you know, it evolved into well, why don't we sell some merch? Why don't, let's record some Beatles songs and sell them at the gig. And then once we started recording, it's like, well, Bob and I are, we've been collaborating for decades. Let's write a couple of songs that are kind of Beatlish. And uh, it, you know, so it kind of evolved into uh, this odd, th but successful thing that we do, which is we uh, dabble in both. You know, this is the era of the tribute band. If you go see Todd Rundgren, he's probably going to, you know, he, he, he'll often play his own album. He'll do a tribute to an album of himself. Or, you know, if you go see Roger Waters, he'll do The Wall. I mean, it's not only are there tribute acts playing in theaters across America and the world, but um, even the guys who originated the music are kind of dabbling it back in that. So, you know, we're, we kind of, it's a bait and switch. We call ourselves a tribute act, but if we, but we take. No, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> well, no, we don't, but we're booked as it maybe sometimes. Sometimes. And then we uh, trick the audience into, I like to think that we're secretly an all original band and uh, we, uh, we trick people into coming to see us because we play Beatles so well. Mm -hmm. I think we all feel that way. Yeah. I I do think, and I remember when talking to the two of you, when your first album came out, what impressed me the most wasn't just the fact that you were doing Beatles, but you were doing rare Beatles. You were doing songs they wrote for other people. That means a lot. It's for you. Mm -hmm. um, even a song from the Let It Be sessions, Because I Know You Love Me So. Yep. It's not the typical Beatles stuff. And even later on, you weren't really doing Beatles hits. You know, no. You're a Rich Man is a cool track to do, even though I hope every Beatle fan is aware of it. They should know every song in the catalog. But it wasn't, you know, the typical A-side of a single hit. Yeah, and, and they should. And and we're we're pretty dedicated at this point that if we're going to do a Beatles song on a record, we're going to do an original arrangement of it. And mm. and and Glenn has, has come up with really great ideas in that regard. Uh, and and so you know, we treat those songs. You know, I've just seen a face, and she's leaving home, as though they were our, our own. You know, we're we're take we're just taking them. Right. <laughs> well, we you know, and to be fair, the band really is a good collaborative effort. Everybody uh, works on these songs together. We we know these when we do a cover, everybody knows. You know, we start together with the original, and then we say, okay, how can we? How can we take this apart and put it back together? Um, yeah, I, I'll say something about Beatles fans. I have been educated. I've been surprised at how what I expected Beatles fans to know about the Beatles. Uh, it was over. It's been an overestimation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we recorded a version of "What's the New Mary Jane" because I thought. You know, we've got to be like the only band or possibly the only band on earth that covered that song, Let's Do It, and and won't everybody notice. And I have to say that, um, you know, when we play these Beatle uh, conventions, 
we just played Beatles on the Beach. We're about to play uh, the fa the Fest for Beatles fans. We've played Abbey Road on the River. It's surprising how the audiences to those gigs are really into the hits. I don't they are. I don't blame them, but I I thought the Baby or a Rich Man would be like some cool insider thing that we do, we do a decent version of it. But I am surprised that, uh, you know, I, maybe it's time, maybe the further we get from the 60s, uh, the less the minutia is paid attention to. Mm. And the other thing is that we, the four weaklings are like you, Ken, uh, you know, Beatle freaks, we pay close attention to the minutia. We read every book there is to read and you know we pay really close attention and and maybe that's ahead of uh, uh you know 50 percent of the audience i don't know it could uh, be the younger audience of today yeah. they may have been brought up on the beatles one yeah yeah that's right. i think that's I, I think that's right i we i had one fan come up to me at a show and mention because you know i love you so uh and say that he thought he found us because he found us doing that cover because nobody else has ever done that song. Uh, this is what the guy told me. And that's why he came to the show. So there's a little bit of that, but that's that's kind of an exception. I mean, most of the fans, if they're not really into the, it, it, knowing the weaklings well and they're coming in cold, they're kind of expecting to hear Beatle hits. But we love those fans. Yeah. You know, like those are the people that I want to talk to. Well, we win them over too. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, since you both have written on your own and you write together, how do you decide what's a weakling song or what's a solo song? <laughs> a really good question. Um, we don't. We don't really. Yeah, we don't <laughs> really. You know, I, I think that we pitch songs to the band. I mean, that for me, I, don't, I can't hurt for Glenn, but for me, that filter as to what songs would be a a Bob solo album or to a weekly song, I make that decision before I submit the song to the band. Yeah. So I've already made that choice, mm. you know? Yeah. And like a lot of the, you know, the songs on Domino Effect, I had been doing in my solo shows for years. And I took a break from working on that record to, 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 to join the Weaklings and work on the Weakling stuff. So, I mean, some of those songs are actually pretty old, uh, but I let it, I let it sit for a while. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 When, when I'm working on an idea before I show it to Bob or anybody, um, it's like, okay, the, this is, this is a song for the weaklings, mm. or not, you know, the, and, and so we do have kind of a pre preview of w what we're writing for, or I, that's where I'm at. It's like, mm. okay, I'm writing a song for the weaklings or coming up with ideas that would work for a power pop band that loves the 60s yeah mm -hmm. and at the same time in, in in sessions the sessions where glenn and i get together in the same room and work on a song i mean that's pretty much going to be a weekling song so yeah, yeah. okay pretty much. pretty much yeah i was just wondering glenn if you really you know thought that way if it's going to be poppier let's make it a weekling song yeah i you know i will say this the raspberry park as an album See, I think of it as the least Beatley record that we've done. Mm. So it's interesting to hear you can say that, um, you know, it, 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 it does kind of remind you of maybe the Magical Mystery Tour era or, or whatever it was. Um, and well, uh, we were just right, like in the beginning, we, we had all of these rules about let's act like the 80s never happened and let's record using you know, direct to tape and let's, you know, let's go to Abbey Road and only use a few mics on the drums. And, we, you know, we did all of this nerdy planning and, and we had all of these rules. And, mm -hmm. and for this album, we loosened up and said, let's just make a good sounding record and let's come up with some good songs. Um, but there you go. If, if, if you ever come up with great pop songs, uh, then you're, or I should say good pop songs, then mm. you're, uh, and power pop songs, you're probably in Beatles realm, you know? It's true. Now, when it comes to Beatles material, how do you select those songs when the catalog is so solid 
song song for song you know you can make a case for covering any Beatles song yeah well it's, we could it's we like could. a challenge on one hand if you said to us uh yes it is mm -hmm. weaklings I give you a month to come up with an, a new arrangement to yes it is we, uh, could do it. we could do it it wouldn't necessarily be good but we could maybe come up with something we'll, um, we'll, be, we'll be back in a month yeah yeah let's do it let's do another another interview um you know I, really it's i don't even know it, it's like uh i've just seen a face which is on raspberry park um that that just kind of came out you know it was just kind of a you know there's a melody that i walk around singing i'm sure we all do it's in your head it's you know just tattooed to my brain and uh so the melody is just really there and then you just try superimposing a different drum beat you know or a different groove and uh, you start playing with the chords a little bit you know it's just fun it's fun I, I love that one because I think that one sounds very very different from the Beatles version uh, a lot of people have said how they like we took the Beatles intro and turned it into a bridge instrumental bridge uh it's cool but the, the interesting thing is although it's a lot different from the Beatles version when we play it live, I watch the audience and they're all singing along. They know all the words. Great melody. I would hope so. <laughs> but I mean, uh, that, that, what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be the, uh, a note for note Beatles tribute version. Yeah. We could do a non-tribute version, our own version, and it still is just as powerful with the audience. So great. We have a version of the word, uh, which I'll bet there is a percentage of the audience who it takes a while to realize what we're doing. Um, first of all, the word was not a hit single. Right. And, um, and then our version is very different feel wise and everything than the Beatles version. So, I mean, there might even, yeah, there's probably members of the audience who don't know that song, you know, if we're, if we're playing like a kind of a, in, in front of an audience that, it, came to see a Beatles band and don't really know much about the weaklings. Yeah. Uh, I, I can imagine there's people in the audience that really don't realize that this slamming song we're doing <laughs> was originally a Beatle track. Yeah. Well, I remember saying to you, Glenn, that, um, cause she would, uh, let me hear she's leaving home, um, before the album came out. And I really liked the arrangement. Um, kind of like it's also in three four time or six eight right she's leaving That's home right. so good. it's so it would remind me of joe cocker <laughs> and what he did with little yeah. my friends more of a bluesy arrangement to it and it works yep better to be compared to joe cocker than like you know the Bee Gees versions of the <laughs> sergeant pepper uh movie better oh. to be compared to joe cocker than the beatles I think. His, her, his version is extremely important. Uh, you know, a little help from my friends by Joe Cocker is the, it, it's kind of it reminds me of all along the watchtower by Jimi Hendrix uh -huh. has, has eclipsed Bob Dylan's all along the watchtower. It's similar, you know? Yeah. Well, it's hard for me to admit that when it comes to any Beatles song, because I love a lot of covers. Don't get me wrong. I love more cover versions than ever before. And when someone puts their own stamp on it, that's what I really, when I really admire the artist, um, instead of doing a note for note copy. And no doubt about it, Joe Cocker's version is so unique and so original. Yeah. But to me, nothing could ever beat the Beatles. Well, <laughs> just me, you know. No, as a record, nothing can so far, nothing has beat the Beatles. However, <laughs> there are some really, really great uh covers uh got to get you into my life by earth wind and fire i think it's my brilliant. favorite cover you know yeah uh so a great the thing is a great song hello jack uh a great song can handle a great reinterpretation you know i say that all the time in my work the song is more important than anything else the strength of the song yeah. and uh, the proof of how great the beatles catalog is one of them anyway one of the proofs is how many cover versions there are and so many different arrangements 
I mean, I th I think when you're when you're doing something original with the Beatles song, mm. you invite less comparison to the Beatles. You know, when you try to do that, when you try to be the Beatles, you try to copy the Beatles, then you're inviting comparison and you're going to lose no matter what. Mm -hmm. You're never going to win that. That, right. you know, can't be done. Yeah. Note for note. Just makes you think about the original. Yeah. You know, and I, I do feel that way uh, at times if I go, if I do see a uh, another band doing a tribute or something, I do sit there, especially, you know, if I know the songs, mm -hmm. uh, you just you just watch and you're kind of looking for them to do something wrong or to miss a detail. That <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. And most of them do. Yeah. How do you not if you're not, you know, if you're, if you're not those guys, even uh -huh. the feel, the feel of Ringo's grooves and the and the tone of George's guitar. I mean, all of that stuff is just like, oh, my gosh. And, and not to mention their voices, which, you know, they're, they're magical. They were magical. Yeah. You mentioned Earth, Wind and Fire, and that's my favorite Beatles cover of all time. Remarkable yeah. thing about that version is that it was a hit record. It came from the Sgt. Pepper soundtrack That's but it was good. a hit record two years after the beatles version was a hit record because the beatles version was released as a single in 1976 when rock and came Just out two years yeah i didn't know that yeah Holy cow. Holy why did they do that off revolver you mean yeah the version from revolver but rock and roll music was a compilation that came out in 1976 a double album of all rockers and they released got to get you to my life as a single from that collection and it went to number seven on the charts. Wow. wow. Did not know that. Two years later, Earth, Wind & Fire had a hit. It takes guts to release, you know, a single that was just a hit. It's like Wilson Pickett recorded Hey Jude. Hey Jude, yeah. And it released it as a single not that long after the Beatles version was a single. You know, I specifically remember a time at which the Beatles... It seemed to me, my perception was that the Beatles weren't as big a deal as they are now. Like in the 70s, um, it, it, or maybe the 80s, but, but I remember like they, they were really important. Uh, in the 70s, Beatlemania, the show on Broadway began. And so there was that, but then eventually that went away and they th then Stig would put out the uh, Peter Frampton Bee Gees version of uh, the movie. Uh -huh. uh, but then it kind of got quiet for a yeah, while. That, well, that movie, that movie did it. The movie killed everything. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> Actually, you know, the, the, in the 70s, the, the Beatles had solo careers. That's and right. The real exception to that is George Harrison, who also had a very successful career in the 80s. Yeah. yeah. But, but the others didn't. And I think Glenn's right. I, mean, I think that in the 80s, it was kind of like eh, going down a little bit, but it's back. So, <laughs> well, there were hit records for both Paul and John. In the yeah. 80s. yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the first half of the 80s was pretty good for Paul. And I love the second half of the 80s probably more than any other period for Paul. But his um, Press to Play album didn't do that well on the charts. Right. The Jarrett picked things up a bit. I I, really I often agree. wonder I wonder if Paul uh, was disappointed because he started this other band Wings and he had hits he had big hits with Wings but at some point the nineties you know the it started to turn into like well yeah Wings is cool but the Beatles are really cool. You know, and I, I I often just privately wonder, like, was that a drag for McCartney? Did he did he feel like he had moved on, and uh, he, you know, and the Beatles was this other thing that happened early on when he was in his twenties, and you know, he, you know, I I just wonder. But the '90s is the period during which they did "Free as a Bird," "Real Love," and they started working on uh, the, the new one. Yeah, by the '90s, I guess he gave up. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I'm sure he's very proud of all the solo music that he's put out. But a lot of artists don't realize that the way that this industry is built is that it's very youth oriented. And when it comes to new music from veteran artists, it gets harder and harder to get airplay. You got to find other outlets or different formats of radio when radio was really important. 
some will say it still is important. I certainly hope it is. And um, for all the veterans that are out there, it gets really tough for their new stuff to get played as opposed to all the classic old stuff. You know, Ken, we've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we are similar in, in that. We are. Uh, Bob and I are songwriters and uh, uh, we had more activity uh, with covers and cuts uh, in the 80s and early 90s. And now the idea of our original music with the Weaklings, you know, this is part of the trick of why we kind of base a lot of our uh, live stuff on Beatles. Mm -hmm. uh, is because it's our it's a way to get our foot in the door and then like i call it a bait and switch it's like okay you like that song we'll check this out and right. buy our album while you're at it you know um but it is it's very tricky for uh new music and and i know a lot of young artists who are writing great songs and stuff uh and it does appear to me a lot harder than it was uh Radio is a different animal. Record mm -hmm. sales. What is rec what is a record? What what is a CD? Who uh, has a CD player? You know, it, it's <laughs> well, I, I happen we to have an old car. I have it in my car, you know. Yeah. But but really the majority of listening goes on the internet. Mm -hmm. it's streaming. That's just the way it is. So and who's buying if it's free, you know? So uh it's not it's just a different world in terms of uh original music but damn it we don't care we're forged <laughs> on, we keep writing the songs and damn it they're good songs so there yeah, yeah. and um I, i'll promise to get off my soapbox here but i do happen to believe with the industry changing the way it is there's so many podcasts out there there's so many youtube channels out there you never know when it comes to something like the solo beatles if it's going to get more and more appreciated as time goes on, because there's more reassessment of mm -hmm. that. Work. Just yeah. like, you know, I say this on all the podcast shows, look at Ram. Great. Look at the respect that Ram is getting today <laughs> and right. early McCartney stuff of the seventies. Yeah. Hey, right. You know, um, you just never know. You don't. Yeah, Ram, Ram only had, uh, did it have one single? Was another day on it? No, Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey. Oh, okay, the, Uncle the, Albert. Yeah, but yeah, I, I remember it, and I remember it wasn't that big a deal. Actually, at that time, I think it was uh, "All Things Must Pass," and and a few years later, Ringo's Ringo album was huge. Yeah. Oh no, uh, the first McCartney album, McCartney went to number one, and Ram went to number two. Well, there you go. Oh, so, and Uncle Albert was a number one hit. Yeah. Okay. No. So yeah. McCartney always had commercial success throughout the 70s. He didn't always have critical success, which bothered him. Right. Yeah. So I was listening to Emmett Rhodes, so I, I didn't notice <laughs> at the time. We just copied McCartney by playing everything. That it first great. album on ABC is killed. Oh, tremendous. Tremendous. Great. It's such a shame that he passed away a few years ago. Did you ever meet him? I never met him. Oh. Okay. I, I heard, I've heard, I've talked to people who, who knew him and, and stuff and, uh, he was kind of a tortured guy, I think. Tortured soul. Mm. Talented. I've heard that, too. Why don't we uh, discuss specific songs on the new album? First of all, like we used to do. Very strong rocker there. With all the come-ons. <laughs> um, you know, it kind of reminds me a bit of um, I Like It Like That. Wow. Wow. You didn't um, think that when you were writing that song? That's the first I'd ever thought of that. Um, yeah, w when you say "come on," I think the, of the Raspberries, and we're a big we're. Oh, yeah. I think we're all Raspberries fans, you know. Uh, didn't the Raspberries come from where you're from, Bob? They did. They're from yeah. Cleveland, and I I grew up near about 100 miles from Cleveland. I used to see the Raspberries play when they were before they got signed. So, yeah, I love them. Great power pop. Um, great. But yeah, it, well, it's a call and response. Well, here's the truth about like we used to do. Mm. Uh -oh. um, uh, the uh, I, I've had the I've had this lick a long time, but um, I wanted that song for 
we we wrote that song for um Joe Grishecki of Joe Grishecki and the House Rockers. Um, and I had this idea that we're involved in in this thing called Light of Day. It's it's oh, it's yeah, yeah it's it, it's a charity fundraising uh, group of concerts that happen all over the world that our manager is very involved in. And uh, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we made an album, you know, the Weaklings with Willie Nile, who always appears there, Jesse Mallon, who always appears there, Joe Grishecki, who always appears there. And and he's also good friends with Bruce Springsteen, who often plays with him and stuff like that. So that was my original concept for like we used to do. And I don't know, I guess it was you, Bob, that uh, I, I kind of showed it to you. Uh, you, pr- you probably got involved in the in in uh, some ideas r- yeah, writing yeah. some of the parts and yeah. um and somebody said no this is a, this is for us don't don't give it to Joe Grishecki. yeah that sounds that sounds like me <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's that's my story of that song well that's a powerful opening track i mean i know raspberry park is the opening but i mean full song and I love, there's a lot of great lead guitar work on this album. So that's all John? Yes. Yeah, John, John oh. really did a great job. He really did. John's a great player. And and he's, yeah, he does compose these uh, solos and his tone and everything, man. The, the guy, he's, uh, he's a pretty special cat, really. Yeah, there's a lot of fast guitar playing and very memorable lines. And I love what I'm hearing. You know, wherever there's a guitar solo, it's really, it's it's superb. I agree. I agree. Okay. Kudos to you, John, if you get to watch this. Out there, yeah. <laughs> uh, talk about Brian Jones, the song. I know you said earlier um, the bass line very much like the beat goes on. I was thinking about um, She's Just My Style. Mm, Gary Lewis. Yeah, it's similar to that, too. Yeah. Well, I don't know that song. So <laughs> you're a sixties person too. <laughs> I, well, I'm, I don't know. I don't know everything from the sixties, but I love it. I love that people very often will pick one of our songs and say, Oh, it sounds like this, or you got influenced by that. And and I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> and in this, in this case, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. So, <laughs> <laughs> But that is predominantly Bob's song. Okay. And, and Bob uh, came to us with uh Brian Jones and um, it, you know, I just, I think it's great. I also think it's, it, yes, it's a great bass line. I was a little nervous about it. I was like, boy, that's an exact ripoff, but you know, you can't, I don't think you can uh, copyright a bass riff. Um, and, and I also thought it was a very clever hook for a Beatle ish band mm-hmm. to have a song about the guy who started the Rolling Stones. You know. hmm. it's catchy as hell what is the actual yeah. message in the song i mean you talk about the world being so cruel you know when you well think- i mean it, it the song roughly roughly goes through his arc you know mm-hmm. from where he starts out where he's he's with the first guy in england <clears throat> that really masters the slide guitar blues slide guitar moves on to the drug problem moves on to his death uh in, in a not a very explicit way, but it's definitely referenced, you know. <laughs> and then uh, we borrowed some lines from uh, existing Rolling Stone songs. That's true too. Again, tell me, you missed a couple of things. Yeah, tell me, is it was, it was the Rolling Stones' first hit, right? What was? Well, tell me. actually, um, well, first original hit. I want to be that okay. I yeah. want to be your man yeah. was the first hit, but. But tell me, he's on the first album, and it was the it was the only original song on the album. Oh yeah, see, you sing it as such common words, and you don't think <laughs> you don't think of the Rolling Stones. No, no, I, I and it's phrased very differently, and I delivered yeah. that was on purpose. But yeah. if you look at it, it's 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 a quote. Okay. Wait a minute. I, now now I'm learning. At what point in uh, Brian Jones is there Rolling Stones melodically? Quoted lyrically. Lyrically, tell me oh. you got to tell me. Oh, oh. Now you know, I, you know uh, tell me you're coming back to me. Is that you right. know, it's, it's 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 the same. 
Gee, wow, cool. <laughs> How do you not know this? You're in the band. Yeah. We don't I know everything. More interviews to find. We don't know everything. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's a really cool song, though. I just I hear something like that, and it's like, how can this not be a hit on the radio? That's yeah, I like it too. I, I it's a very I think it's a really strong song, and yeah. it sticks in your head the melody and all. Just... Yeah. All right, uh, I've just seen a face we talked about a little bit, but I will say that what I like most of all is that it's more of a punkish version to me, and I like when you're trading off the lyrics back and forth with the harmonies in the middle which is very different. So when you do something like that, that's a, you know, you change the arrangement so much, as we said before, I appreciate the effort. There's a, I don't want to give anything away, but since we're talking about this kind of stuff, there's a little bit of hint of uh, XTC in that version. You yeah, can be right. listen to this album many, many times over to find more things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really happy with how that one came out. Uh, yeah, I mean, I again, I'm I'm happy with this album because by that point, in the listening, you know, you've heard three uh, songs that, uh, you know, it's just they're all strong to me. Mm -hmm. so I'm tooting my own horn here or our own horn, but um, I think it's a good record. <laughs> well, somebody's got to. <laughs> I know that your stuff gets played a lot on Little Steven's channel. Yep. So um, the format of AAA in radio, I can easily see so much of the stuff getting played. Well, that's our next. That's our next uh, market we want to break. Oh, really it belongs to... on there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When you say AAA, you mean the uh, Automobile Association of America, right? <laughs> because they're they've got the CDs in those cars, and they're the ones. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, I think it's, I never remember what it stands for. Album Alternative. Yeah, adult. No, adult it's Alternative. Adult, album. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. But any any format that's playing Wilco and Death Cab for Cutie and, mm -hmm. you know, your band belongs on there. Well, I love those. I love those bands. I love that music. Uh, maybe when we grow up, well, maybe when we get a little older, they'll play us on those stations. Okay, all the cash yeah. in the world. Another that's a very Beatley song to me, anyway. Yeah, okay. Uh the story behind that one. That's, uh, a, that's a Glenn song. Let, you uh, know. No, but, but you you wrote a lot of lyric. Um yeah. you know, that, that's really the way I write songs is a lot of times. Often I'll come up with a lot a lyric or a title and then write a song around it. And that's, that's really what happened there. I thought that, you know, what's a good title, you know, all of the cash in the world would be an int a, you know, it would be of interest to an audience, mm. especially in a, in a society like, you know, in the era of Trump, but um, you know, so uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I just came up with the, uh, the meat of it. And Bob uh, helped out a lot with the lyrics and, and, and the bridge. Um, and uh, yeah, no, and I know, go ahead. I was going to throw in that the lyrics uh, also kind of borrow a little bit from you too. It does? <laughs> you said it. I did? You did. Wow. I'll have to think about that. I'll have to <laughs> listen to that. <laughs> I, you know, I will say that in my songwriting lately, I'm dealing with a lot of personal stuff. And this is definitely a song. I know you're not supposed to talk about this shit, but uh, this is definitely a song coming from an older guy. Uh -huh. It's, 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 uh, I'm reflecting uh, back, you know, looking at my life as a whole from this perspective. Hmm. And, um, you know, and regrets and all, you know, well, there are no regrets, but uh, mistakes and all, it's like owning it and saying, here, this is my life and, and I wouldn't change it. I'm cool with it, you know. Right. Yeah. And that's a great feeling to have when you accept that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, as much as um, 
I love the original stuff on the album. The first song that really leaped at me as though this should really be a single <laughs> is Mr. Soul Satisfaction. <laughs> I really think that combining those two songs and also sneaking in a monkey song too, which was very <laughs> clever, it really worked very well. Um, who thought of that idea? And you had Peter Noon sing it second time, actually, on a Weaklings album for Peter, right? Yeah. So um, how did that happen, getting Peter? And, and who thought of combining those two songs? Great questions. Yeah. Take, take, them in, take them in reverse order, Glenn. All right. Well, well uh, how to come apart? I mean, uh, out, how to, what was the outcome or where to begin? Um, really, it's a really simple exercise the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. That is the main riff of the Rolling Stones' Satisfaction, which is a very important song, mm -hmm. uh, certainly to the Rolling Stone, but also to my ears in 1966 or whatever it was ba, ba, da, 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 mm -hmm. da, da, that rhythm and when you listen to hello mr soul and then you know so you, you switch one you put them together you mash them up and then the monkeys <laughs> It's so that was a very well, everybody was ripping off the stones, is really kind of what it was, you know. Uh -huh. But it was such a great hook, and it's a rhythmic hook. So you just put you just throw them all together and see what you got. And, th and we were looking for a somebody to sing it. So, you know, we could sing it, but you know, we said, you know, whose voice would be great on this? Southside Johnny. And he lives down the street from me, you know, he lives in Ocean Grove and I'm just outside of Asbury Park. We know him well, we see him all the time. So Joe asked him and, and uh, cause Smoke's like our, our drummer, Joe Belia, uh was in the Asbury Jukes for a number of years. So hmm. Joe asked, and, and I think, I think Johnny said, yeah. He he said, yeah. yeah. But, but he never, but he just never showed up. Kept, kept dragging his feet. <laughs> and then and then I'll let, I'll let bob continue the story <laughs> so then we were you know we had considered other singers too we were trying to find somebody and i was in chicago last august uh for beetle fest uh-huh fest beetles and i i had dinner in a restaurant and i look over at a couple tables over and i said that looks like peter noon walked mm -hmm. over to the table and said excuse me are you peter because we had, we met him before we did the album but we didn't didn't know him well Right. Uh, and, and, and I hadn't seen him in a while, you know. So I, I said, this, are you Peter? And he, he says, yeah. And I said, well, I'm I'm Bob with the Weaklings. Oh, love the Weaklings. Mm -hmm. I said, well, would you would you like to work on our next record with us? Oh, I'd love to do that. So uh, that's really how it came about is by I ran I ran into the guy in Chicago at a restaurant. <laughs> Who and Peter had uh appeared on an earlier album about yeah it. right did he was on three on friday my mind but you know i'll tell you what and his voice is fantastic the guy is. he's he's so still working his butt off he's touring and his voice is just as good if not better than ever i mean i don't know how old he is but he's holding up uh as good if not better than anybody from the original british invasion in the 60s well thank you for saying that i've seen him many times in concert and every time his voice sounds perfect <laughs> yep he's great and and what a nice guy what a he's, great guy you guys don't mind that i feed my cats while we're doing this right no, no. Not at all. Okay. you're a beetle fan you're an animal lover <laughs> i guess <You> to be. <laughs> um so yeah, I mean that was a, a great idea to combine those two songs and Valerie. Uh your cover of I'm on Fire. What made you want to do that particular Springsteen song? I think that might be a kind of controversial. What do you think, Bob? Um, I guess so. I mean, but it, it, our our manager, uh Tony, Caesar Weakling, had suggested that we do a Bruce Springsteen song and you know, Glenn walked into the dressing room at, a, at we were playing up in New York City, and he said, "Hey, listen to this," 
And he played, you know, basically played it as a rockabilly number on, on an acoustic guitar. And we said, great, let's go with it. Let's go with it. So, you know. And we, and we all know Bruce. Uh -huh. um, and um, because we're, that's where we all live, uh, with the exception, of, John's a Brooklynite. But the three of us know uh, Springsteen and um. And and we didn't know at the point at that point that we were going to call the album Raspberry Park, but nevertheless, it is we are in this world here. Uh, little Steven plays us on his radio station. Mm. You know, it's it, Southside Johnny is is a, a guy that we know, and everybody. Right. You know, this is our neighborhood. Um, so I don't know. It was just kind of an idea. Uh, Let's do a Bruce song and and let's do it rockabilly style. And I say it's controversial because it's it, it it could be a leap. I would think that you know Bruce fans are fanatics, and um, it's a bit of a leap because to to even touch the holy grail of Bruce uh -huh. is is a little uh, risky, and yeah. um and and you could interpret I'm on fire as um, a lighter take on a tortured lyric. But, uh, and, and I have heard that criticism twice now, but I, my, my answer is Dancing in the Dark, uh, actually, as well as Born in the USA, they're both rock anthems. You know, Dancing in the Dark was like a disco anthem, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and really, but read the lyrics. You Darn. know, they're all tortured. <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, Bruce taking those dark thoughts and just adding an uplifting beat to it and uh, making a hit record out of it. So, you know, so why not? Why not uh, try to reinvigorate? Our, well, rearrange our own version of a Bruce Springsteen song. And we did. It was played on the on the Springsteen channel. Yeah. So you know we wouldn't have been on the Springsteen channel if we hadn't done something like that. So it it gives us an opportunity to again reach out a little further, sp spread out, just have some different people hear us. Yeah. Do you know if Bruce has heard it? Don't know about that. Hmm. You know we should ask Max, uh, uh, Bob, John Marjavi, and myself. The three of three of the weaklings. Hmm. play with Max Weinberg a lot and Joe does on occasion as well. Um, and we see Max all the time. I don't even know if Max has heard it. I don't know. Think, I don't think he has. We should probably give him a, an album. I wonder if uh, he has a CD player. <laughs> uh, well. Do you think that um, Bruce really likes different arrangements of his own songs? Does he appreciate that? or I, I don't know him that well. I do know that he does seem to like artists that kind of sound like he does, you know, uh, that are, are in his ballpark. But I, you know, my guess is, well, I don't know. I mean, he, I know this, and I know he didn't like what Manford Mann did with uh, Blind yeah. by the Light. Yeah. I know he didn't like that, but I, you know, he, he's a, he's a rockabilly fan. He's a James Burton, Scotty Moore fan. So I, I I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think he'd like it. Yeah. Good it's still a compliment no matter what. So. Yeah. Yeah. He's a nice guy. Never met him. That. He's always nice when, when we nice. when I've met him. He's always yeah. good. To, you know. Yeah. Okay. Talk about April's Fool. Now, there's a song where you definitely have some Beatles references. Um, uh, yep. Saying, How can you laugh when you know I'm down in there? And there's a riff that's similar to Hey Bulldog in there. You know, everybody says that, but the truth of the matter is, Hey Bulldog is not in there. The thing that people refer to as sounding like Hey Bulldog is not Hey Bulldog at all. It's uh, Apricot Brandy by, by uh, um, uh, you know... Uh, Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros. And uh, Heart of the Sunrise by Yes <laughs> is really what it is. Yeah, I and it's so. not it's not Hey Bulldog. I'm making a note of that, so now I got to listen more carefully. <laughs> but that was a song that our our record company said, "Hey, would you write an April a song for April Fool's Day?" 
Uh, and we took it as, you know, kind of a, an assignment or a challenge. You know, it's like, well, who's going to, I never would have thought to do that, but, you know, he, he was kind of pushing it. And so we tried it out, you know, and, and uh, a lot of people like the song. It's fun to play. All the originals are really strong here. So it's yeah. it's tough to say this one's the best one. Yeah. A few listens and they're stuck in your head, which is <laughs> kind of a great commercial song. Um, None of Your Business. Tell me about that. I'll bet Jeff Bridges is very happy that you wrote that song. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my favorite line. That's that's my favorite line in the whole the whole thing hmm. is is the Jeff Bridges line. I just think because I love that movie and I just think it's the funniest thing. Uh -huh. But uh, you know, uh, well, there's quotes in that song which you haven't mentioned. But I'll tell you this much: they're not Beatle quotes. Okay. You want to share a few? Well, did you ever hear the, all the way? But the the, the ventures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the walk don't run. It's walk yeah. don't run. Yeah. yeah, I was going to mention it. Yeah, okay. That was that seemed pretty obvious to me. Well, it is pretty obvious. <laughs> I think it's a great it's a great rock song. I, I and I also I personally think when that song starts, it's the best sounding moment on the record. It it's grabs just, your attention. Just it, one guitar, and it's Bob, and it just it's this fat. It's almost, it's very Kinks like people yeah. say that. Yeah, it is. But um, yeah, no, I love it. It's just uh, I'm I'm really happy about that song being on the album. Me too. It, it grabs your attention, and and we play it live. It's you know it's pretty pretty tough not to tap your toe to that one. So, yeah, I agree with you. Um, talk about John Rajavi. In in the past, didn't he write some of the material on your albums? And this is all the two of you writing, right? Yeah, he started, he, he started writing a song. Uh, and uh, yeah, he wasn't he, he he didn't want to finish it. He, we we got we kind of had a demo of it, but um, yeah, he I I think he just wasn't satisfied. Would you say that, Bob? I would say that's true, and that's not the first time that's happened. We, there was a song that we wrote for Studio Two that that, uh, that John wrote, and you know, John typically either Glenn or I will kind of give him a little help with with the writing, but. But you know, but we still considered his song, you know, thousand miles, and and so. But uh, there was another another song that uh, he kind of didn't want to do it on Studio Two Records, so it didn't make the album. And more recently, he went back and heard it, and he goes, "Boy, that's a really good song. Why didn't I want? Why didn't I want to do that?" So, so I, I think he I think he second guesses himself a little bit, and I would expect that those songs will eventually show up on records. I, you know, Bob and I are very accustomed. To writing songs and we've been doing it for years i don't know that john that it comes as easy to john mm. uh so i th and i you know and when you're a, an early songwriter you can be more self-critical in a way oh yeah you know, it's it's hard to kind of finish the ideas or something but um so i think that that's got something to do with it he's probably a little he's up against Bob's and writing and my writing and maybe maybe that's a little you know for a new for a newer newcomer of songwriting maybe mm. maybe that's a little uh I don't you know I don't, I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine why John didn't finish that song I don't know I just think you know he's uh, he, he second guesses himself with that and he's very self-conscious about it and it's understandable uh and eventually we, we you know eventually we get through with it so hey yeah. listen his strength is in other areas he is he's the best musician in the band he has the best ear um he's the most technical he uh he can uh he's very good with technology he, he's got an engineering degree right bob yeah math actually a math okay yeah. uh he's a brainiac you know and um but his his as you mentioned ken his guitar playing his solos they're they're soaring they're beautiful and uh this record would be a completely different record without it he, he's uh he's a he's our secret weapon so to speak and uh and f this time out he just didn't come up with the uh, uh, you know we didn't record any of his songs mm. well like i said his guitar playing is just outstanding and 
my goodness, it makes you just stand up and notice what a tight band overall it is once you add all of this lead guitar work and how the four of you gel so well together. Um, you were mentioning before the real short pieces you put into the to the album. Mm -hmm. Etude in E. When <laughs> I heard that, I thought of um, it's kind of Blackbird-ish kind of yeah. guitar playing. Were Very you thinking much. that when you were? Yeah, well, yeah. I, you know, I think it's the same with Bob as it is for me with these interludes. Uh, there are little snippets of ideas that of songs that I never finished. Mm. And that's a song that I never finished. Uh, so I just made, uh, but I always really liked the guitar style. Yes, it's very Blackbird-ish. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I just thought, you know, here, here's a little one minute piece to, to try out for the record. So mm. very, very McCartney-ish, but no vocals. And uh, you're right, Blackbird-ish. Also reminds me of James Taylor's first album hmm. on Apple because he had all those little classical. Yeah, that's that true. Played. Well, I, I, and I do like that kind of thing. I, I had a solo album years ago, Palookaville, that had lots of that. Yeah, like every song, every song had a little thing in between. Mm -hmm. and so it's that, that makes it fun for the album maker, you know, and it made it fun for us. But I will say that, again, what is an album? what is a record who sits down other than ken michaels how many people sit down and put an album on start to finish other than bob Berger? because i know that bob does that yeah i like i like albums i don't um, but i only like old albums i don't really listen to new albums you know? i just listen to two new albums uh actually three new albums uh yes like yesterday i like i like the boy genius Did you hear, hear those that i've band? heard of them heard of them three <laughs> three women they're great uh i don't uh, I like them better than I like the album. Actually, I saw them on Saturday Night Live. They were terrific. And I like the album. I don't, I don't like the way it's produced, but I like the songs. And a guy, Noah Cahan, if you've heard of him, uh, he's a new new cat. Um, is, I listen, he has three albums that I, I listen to. I listen to all three of them, actually. So, okay. He's a writer? He's a writer, yeah. I, I think the first album is the best one, but that's, that's where I'm at now. Cool. Do you listen to any new bands at all, Glenn? Or relatively new bands, and when you do, do you look for the same kind of elements that you would hear in '60s music and '70s music? Do you look for that? Um, well, I certainly relate easier, but I can also be more critical mm. when it an act is using uh, is in the same highway that I am and that the Weaklings are in. You know, it's like I'm a little more judgmental. It's like, ah, that's a crummy bridge or, yeah, that's a used idea. That's not so good. Um, but uh, no, there's there's a bunch of great power pop still. There's a, a bunch of great artists. But yeah, I mean, there, I, I'm afraid to say new artists because usually by the time it hits me, they're about 10 years old, <laughs> around for 10 years. Tell me about it. But there's a, there's a band called Lawrence who blows me away it's a brother and sister with a, with the band uh and i don't know like like i said that they're probably they've probably been around for you know three or five years um uh wolf peck is a young band that blows my mind um and there's some atmospheric stuff that i can't actually uh, i gotta think about it but there's some at atmospheric uh stuff out there that is just incredible um that's very uh, see i enjoy getting outside of the power pop thing mm. um yeah there, there's a, there's a thing i just heard called shadow forces that but anyway yes um some world music and stuff like that is great uh but yeah no I, i'm not as attuned to modern pop as Bob is, that's for sure. Okay. Well, you know, speaking of our brother and sister thing, I mean, I was blown away by Billie Eilish. I thought her record was just, the first record is so great. And there's a lot of bands. The Interrupters, I think, are great. Spoon is great. Vampire Weekend is great. I mean, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. So. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a big Billie Eilish fan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, 
we're all different. Some of us, you know, when we, as you get older, not only do you love the music that you heard in your youth that left such a big impression on you, but there's so much great music that you've heard in your lifetime. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like I've heard enough great songs. I don't need any more <laughs> new songs. Yeah, yeah. But you can't think that way though. Yeah, I know, but in some ways I feel like my life is complete from all that I've heard already, but I still want to hear. Well, it blows me away today. I'll tell you, I often go backwards. You know, like I've been listening to a lot of Louis Armstrong lately because I kind of I'm aware of his importance. Yeah. But but it's like I never really kind of dug in and, and you know, and I've always been a bit that way. I, like I want to see what what everything came from. Right. Um, you know, because realizing that I was turned on to the blues from like cream mm -hmm. right you know like these guys in england that completely distorted it and overdid it and all that you know and and eventually it took me and the stones you know mm. and eventually i i decided that i had to look up the real deal muddy waters and robert i I, I totally yeah. relate to what you're saying and i i did the same thing recent not too long ago i i was listening to charlie patton and yeah. Blind Lemon Jefferson, and uh, you know all the all the, blue, the original blues guys. You know, not not just Robert Johnson. As a matter of fact, I wasn't listening to Robert Johnson because I've already heard that one a million times. It's all the other ones I never heard. You know, Muddy and and Hollow Wolf, and uh, so great, you know, great stuff. It helps you to understand why you came to like the more modern artists of yeah. When Cream, I, came. I feel a little foolish sometimes. You know that that you know john mayall was you know my introduction to the blues right. mm -hmm. you know <laughs> you know there that's are a lot of that, that age you know you're too young there yeah. are some Beatles fans out there that don't want to study all the 50s rock that the beatles loved yeah and how can you appreciate the beatles without knowing how big an influence buddy holly was or Chuck beverly's of those people yeah yeah and you're right you're right about that mm. So tell me uh, what the future plans are right now for the Weaklings beyond the fest. More live gigs in uh, in the New York area, or we're doing a we're doing a cruise at the beginning of April. We've never done that before. We're doing the uh, blues cruise with a lot of really big bands. Uh, we're you know, when we got our name on the marquee right with them, so, so I'm happy about that. Okay, uh, so that's exciting. Um. You know, we have I'd have to look at my calendar. I don't we don't have it memorized. We're busy, <laughs> but you know, they're they're right now on our minds, like tomorrow, I think, right, Bob? We we have a yep. uh, Bob and I are involved in a Beatles symposium. Right. Uh, so we we will pick up our guitars and and play and play, play and sing a little bit. But um, you know, we're gonna be discussing uh the Beatles, which uh I'm on a panel that uh, I still have no idea what I'm going to talk about because the, the the subject is why do you think the Beatles music still la is lasting? And I'm like, hey, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'll come, come up with something and I, I have many thoughts about it, but, but really it is like magic to me. It's, it's, uh, it's, complete phenomena that that band that we're talking about them is it 60 years yes, later yeah. you know i mean sure it's is. it's goddamn ridiculous <laughs> and interesting this thing tomorrow glenn and i are each on different panels yeah, yeah. so we're going to each get to have a totally different perspective and i'm i'm kind of blown away may pang is on my panel mm -hmm. which is like uh that's pretty that's exciting you know so, I've yeah. interviewed her many times. Have you? Yeah. I, met her, I met her once up at the cutting room. Uh, she was up there one time. She's uh -huh. lovely. Lovely. Yeah. yeah, it's a pretty remarkable thing when any song or album survives 10 years later, 20 years later, 50 years right. later. And I wish so much other music that I love from the past would be revered as much as the Beatles. But somehow... They're able to find young audiences and keep that music alive. And even though you were talking about streaming before, that's so important today. Uh, Here Comes the Sun was just listed as having 
was it a billion streams <laughs> more than any other Beatles song? That's remarkable. It is. It is. For a song that's that old. So uh, it's a great question it, to ask. I find it interesting that um, songs that might have been hits at the time they were released kind of pale through time and and b-sides let's call it mm. album tracks become the important songs for, you know like there is you know what well, here comes the sun was that a single nope i didn't no. think so yeah and it's, what what it's, an important song that is it's probably one of their biggest songs same with bob my guitar gently weeps uh -huh. right biggest Which was not two of the biggest beatles songs yeah totally yeah it's, it could also be if there's a fatigue factor with the with the a sides yeah you know, possibly of hearing it so the b sides sound fresher mm. or the album cuts sound fresher mm. so i personally the last beatles album i'd want to listen to is one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, because probably true songs that i've heard the most that i yeah. love yeah. yeah but it's all the album cuts that you don't hear as much right um yeah well, well this is why this is why i'm expecting the four weaklings albums to be huge in about 50 60 years okay can't yeah. wait and then your yeah. your great great uh grandkids will be appreciating the money coming in they'll no, we're collect not gonna... all the money yeah we're never gonna die don't worry about that <laughs> all right well this has been amazing we look forward to seeing you at the fest by the way the um the symposium since this is going up on a Friday and the symposiums tomorrow on Saturday, if you guys watching can catch all this information in time, it's at Monmouth University and Ken Womack spearheaded this whole thing. And there's a whole bunch of great people who will be there. Like you said, May Pang, uh, Bruce Spicer, Tom Frangione, a whole bunch of people. Uh, so that will be tomorrow. I'm going to, Put the link for that in the description box for this um for this video and if you have the link by the way for the cruise i can include that too if you want um you find that yeah that's out there so we'll find it yeah okay yeah, i have it yeah so bob and glenn thank you so much for spending time with me and with my my audience here and uh make sure you go to the fest if you can february 9th 10th and 11th at the TWA Hotel at JFK Airport. I look forward to seeing you there on Sunday. You said you're only going to be there on Sunday. Although Glenn is part of Liverpool, the Beatles tribute band, and they will be there all three days. Okay. Yeah, Ken, it's always a pleasure talking with such a musical, such a knowledgeable musical file. Is that the right word? In one of these days, Glenn. Close enough. I'm going to get to play this cart again. But I brought it the last time when he was on WDHA many, many years ago when he performed This Boy. It wasn't, wow. uh, I didn't interview him at the time. But wow. nice. I have this cart because I stole it. Oh, man, <laughs> there's some hidden technology there. <laughs> all right, Glenn and Bob, thanks so much. Thanks to all of you for watching. If you can, please subscribe to the channel. And, uh, once again, New Weakling CD, Raspberry Park. Go out and get it now. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ken. All right. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you soon.